Hello everyone, you're listening to the Socially Desi Show, the podcast that motivates you to live, create and inspire. If this is your first time here, welcome. On our show, we discuss tips and strategies with our guest speakers on how to tackle problems related to personal growth, mental health, relationships, business and entrepreneurship and health and fitness. So hit that subscribe button and go check out our website at sociallydesi.com for more of such content. Today, I'm joined by Savita Sastri. She is a Bharatanatyam artist and a filmmaker. Hello, Savita. Welcome to the show. Hello, Anurag. How are you? Glad to be part of it. I am doing great, Savita. Thank you so much for being on the Socially Desi show today. Uh, you know, when I looked at the YouTube videos that you did uh, and uh, the way you brought the storytelling aspects to Bharatanatyam and showcased it to the world, I, I was really thrilled to get you on the episode as soon as possible. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. I think we are great storytellers in India and um, um, dance is just uh, another unique way of bringing stories through the medium to um, more and more people. I completely agree with that because dance is one of the oldest forms of storytelling and really loved the way you know you brought out that aspect into the filmmaking as well. We'll talk about more of that, but uh, to our audience, Savita, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about your professional journey so far? Coming from uh, the background that I do as a South Indian, it wasn't anything unique that I was um, I was learning the art form itself um, during the um, 80s, which was when I was a young person growing up. Um, it was um, music, dance. These were the primary hobbies that one pursued outside of uh, school. So um, I started very young and, and it was, it was um, an exposure to Hindi cinema, in fact, that um, really ignited my passion to learn uh, dance forms. And um, watching, you know, on the um, television, my idols, Hema Malini and uh, dancers like Bhai Mala Bali, in their uh, film avatars, of course, right. uh, bring to life these larger than, you know, really um, uh, the the Bollywood numbers. Yeah. And I would uh, imitate them uh often uh, bringing my household help as my companion <laughs> okay. with it. And we would lock the room and dance around. Uh, and it was uh, eventually through, um, you know, a hard sell that I had to make to my parents, mm -hmm. trying to convince them um, that I wanted to study. And in those days, there really wasn't any opportunity to study Bollywood dancing because okay. there was no form that was, mm. um, that had the... The so-called, uh, you know, nowadays you can go to um, go to a Bollywood class. In those days, if you wanted to learn dance, you were put into a classical dance class. True, true. So I was um, then, um, you know, uh, taken to a guru uh, in mm -hmm. Mumbai, and I started my journey. Um, and I've never looked back in a sense from there, but. Dance itself had to take a hiatus during several stages of my life. So while I okay. continued to learn it all the way till my you know, end of my college degree, uh, life took me um, on a journey where it was very evident to me that I had to place academics as my first priority, which is, again, okay. not something unusual. Mm. Um, so the premium for you know, return on investment is in education. And that probably stands true even today. So it was quite uh, evident to me that I had to make a career for myself and mm -hmm. my family was very particular that I uh, study. So in, um, in following my um, academic dreams, I went to America, I studied there, I um, became a neuroscientist and okay. went into corporate wow. life <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, then into academic life and worked for several years. But all along, uh, dance was very um, critical in my student years in America to give me that little bit of extra money. And then mm -hmm. I found that it was something that uh, was very valued in the diaspora because people mm -hmm. who left the country and went abroad wanted to have a deep connection with India. Okay. And classical dance was, you know, uh, a very, um, very appropriate way to have their children uh, be immersed in Indianism. So, you know, in Indianness. Yeah. So yes. I became a teacher. 
Um, so oh, I started having okay. students, um, not not a large school of any kind, but enough mm-hmm. that I was dabbling in dance at all points of time while I was in the U.S. And okay. um, much later in life, I I always had this niggling sense that uh, you no, know, I never really could answer to my true passion. And uh, so when it was uh, much later that I decided, okay, why don't I give it a try? Um, I'm still dancing and my physical body is uh, still able to perform. So I started doing these little forays, little trips to India. And it was a season that um, started in the Mecca of Bharatanatyam, which is Chennai, uh, yeah. there is something called a dance season. So all dancers okay. would would uh, come down during the December holiday season and uh, there would be a month-long dance festival where there would be almost, I don't know, thousands of uh, opportunities for you to perform. And so I would uh, enlist myself in those sabhas, as they're called, venues where these dance performances would happen. And uh, so I tried to get my footing back into the dance world little by little. And um, along that time, I realized that while I had stepped away from India for 20 odd years or so, India had changed. And I had assumed that India was exactly where I left it, which is there would still be, you know, an interest in classical dance. And that would be one of the main sources of entertainment for Mm -hmm. uh, a weekend. Um, one of the sources, not maybe the main, but uh, India had changed so much that uh, dance, classical dance of that kind was nowhere in the radar of entertainment. It had become this exclusive niche of those that were engaged with it and continued to be engaged with it for their own passion or they had somebody committed in the family so they would bring their brothers or their uh, friends or their The generations to continue basically. Yes, yes. So it became a very niche um, hmm. crowd that came only because they had a personal, uh, some sort of personal interest uh, in the dancer that was performing and very Correct. little of, you know, generic, oh, I'm there for the art. So therefore, I would come all the way from America paying these huge amounts of money and there would be 20 or 30 people in the audience. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And that is how it started. My understanding that art needs to evolve um, and if I don't change, then um, what's going to happen is I would have gotten disillusioned and I would have just left. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I had to really evaluate what, uh, you know, what I was presenting and why people were not coming to the shows. Um, while what I found in India was that people were still thronging to cinema. Cinema had not changed. In yeah. all the years that I was away, cinema was still making the same sort of impressions, was getting mm-hmm. the same sort of crowds, if not more, because there was just so many more uh, different kinds of movies that were being made. True. So um, that was, I think, one of the pivotal changes that uh, needed to be done uh, in my personal journey. And mm-hmm. the rest of the story followed from there. Wonderful. No, I completely agree and resonate with one of the points that you made that uh, the the dance form and your style needs to evolve the whole, uh, you know, uh, the perception that people have about a particular dance form or any particular creative art, performing art needs to evolve throughout the the stages of life. And uh, personally, you know, I've seen that because... uh, uh, earlier, you know, back in uh, 2008, nine, uh, I used to be like a hardcore rock head. Okay, so I used to mm-hmm. uh, play rock music. I was in a band. We used to do a lot of hard rock, you know, punk rock. But then, you know, slowly uh, and steadily, I realized that uh, the kind of music that audiences are, uh, you know, uh, flocking to is not exactly what I'm making right now. So even though I love the music, even though you know I, I love music, but the 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 uh, reciprocation of uh, emotions uh, was not there from the audience. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I also started to uh, take my music and mold it in a way that still remains true to me, but appeals to a larger audience. So at the end of the day, you know, I'm evolving with my music and uh, you know, keeping my passion for myself, but also catering to that audience who needs to listen, who wants to listen to a particular style of uh, music. I hope I'm making sense with that. Yeah, very much so. And and that, um, you know, um, that idea of staying true uh, cannot overcome the um, the need of the hour to such a degree that as a traditionalist, um, you know, it's very easy for a classical dancer to hold her art 
higher than the audience. Mm-hmm. So there is that 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 sense that the audience needs to rise up to the level of the art, and and I think that's where I found the dichotomy. Um, sure. The um, you know cinema doesn't look at it that way, and and I personally started realizing that the most valuable thing that I can get out of any audience is their time. And, and honestly, if they have given me the most valuable thing that they possess, uh, it is my responsibility then to make it valuable to them. So, um, so it, you know, they've entrusted me with that responsibility. So therefore, sure. I cannot have them, you know, uh, take on accountability for why why this uh, dance form was not resonating. And I think I think uh, we both uh, have the same same mutual understanding of. Uh, <laughs> yeah of what our responsibility is as an artist. True, true. And was that uh, something which inspired you to take uh, this dance form and put it into a film format? Yeah, so that came, I think, a little later. So after okay. I decided I'm going to jump off the, you know, the the traditional um, the uh, kinds of pieces that mm-hmm. I did, and, and let me just define to you what those pieces were. Very simply, they were all drawn from mythology. So all right. uh, they used to be drawn from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, or the tellings of um, you know stories from uh, from mythology or lore, or, or some of them based in stories of love, because this uh, art form also has the Devadasi, the courtesan yes. tradition um, in it. So these were the pieces that I was practicing and that were taught and handed to me from um, the years of uh, being uh, inducted in a dance school by my teachers. Mm -hmm. So at the point where I took off, um, as I said, I was inspired by cinema. So one thing that I found about cinema was that we did not tell the same stories through cinema while we just changed the actors, which was what we were doing in dance. So we were all telling the same stories and we were just different dancers telling all those stories. So that is not how cinema operates. Each cinema is valued for the story as much as it is valued for the acting. So without the story or the content, there is you know, no point in having the actors to de- uh, deliver the best because it's not going to make an impression at the end of the day. So mm. what we realized was that we really needed to change what we were saying, the content. And so my partner, uh, Shrikanth, is a story writer. And uh, so he um, he was the one that I think made me reflect very deeply on on all of this. And so when I sort of changed the you know um, had the mantle um, up to him to now write me a story that I could deliver through dance, and he writes stories that are based in human emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a sort of agelessness to the stories in that way, in the way that he writes them, because uh, human emotions are universal. And Bharatanatyam has its limitations because it it does have the limitations of form. So okay. while it can be uh, uh, liberating in certain ways of using mm-hmm. that form, um, I would not be able to show an aeroplane, for instance, or, uh, okay. you know, the computer. These are... Mm. These are um, these are not modalities that would fit into the art form as easily. So there had to be an agelessness associated with the story itself. And his way of telling stories was was just remarkable. And it was so steeped in human emotions and human experience. So I was able to start using those stories and, and we developed um, very um, cinema inspired dance, uh, theater productions that we took all around uh, India to start Mm -hmm. with. And then eventually it made trips all around the world for a good 10 years. And um, during that time, we didn't really um, look at doing much on the digital front. But when I finished about a decade, I, I sort of started reflecting on, despite making so many trips, there's only so many people that you can reach out to in a year in a pro, in a you know for one production and you're doing the same True. production over a whole year you're doing a tour yeah. so we started looking at how do you reach larger audiences and this was well before the pandemic and we decided we'll start going digital and that's when first we made a made an effort to archive all the productions that we had taken on tour And then we started moving into short films because we were in one of the workshops. We had a student come up to us and say, well, you know, you tell stories, but it takes an hour to sit and watch it. Can you tell a story in five minutes? 
So mm, right. that was the challenge that was posed to us. <laughs> and we said, okay, why not? True. Why not? I mean, honestly, you can tell a story in, in a much shorter duration. And so we've started making these short dance films. They're not five minutes, but they could be anywhere between five and 15 minutes or so. Mm-hmm. And uh, so this, uh, this has been something that uh, has, I think, really um, allowed me to, um, to use the art form and still keep the, the interest and, and a lot of what we were looking for in that uh, shift um, to um, help us reach audiences all across the world um, in ways and to make the dance form a, really just a medium and the story to be the highlight of um, of our productions of the dance films. So, Savita, what I have seen uh, in the recent past is that uh, with the with the ever shrinking uh, attention span of the audience, especially on social media, it's really difficult for artists to showcase their talent within those. You know, and today you're talking about five minutes. I'm talking about thirty seconds. You know, you look at Instagram, <laughs> you have yeah. those thirty second reels, fifteen second reels, and that's what people are expecting now out of artists mm-hmm. that you entertain us in those 15 or 30 seconds, else we're going to swipe, right? We're going to move ahead. We're going to scroll down. So what were the initial challenges for you when when you had to shrink or maybe, you know, concise your acts, your performances into these shorter intervals? Um, so the, um, I think one of the, you know, the, the challenges that, that, definitely persists in in making something uh, very concise because you don't have the luxury of having that person um, give you that undivided attention as you would get um, for a full length performance where you right. put them in a dark enclosed space and then they have at most their phones to reach for and even that is a flashing bright object so you cannot do that too often. So. True. Um, so when you've taken that away, I think whether you do a one hour production or a five minute production or a 10 minute or 15, I think is, is really, um, is, um, is again, is all boils down to holding the attention because if you can, if you can hold and sustain for 10 minutes, you, you'd be surprised you might be able to get a half an hour out of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yes, you're very right. Beyond that first 30 seconds where that urge to swipe has been, has been overcome and and you have got the attention. So, um, that is, that I think is something that happens, um, uh, first probably by trial and error, uh, where Mm -hmm. you, um, where you look for, you know, things that are successful and, and maybe you've taken, certain steps that ensured that, uh, you know, the, the saleability of, um, of that impact or whatever that you're looking for has made that register. And so you, you arrive at some sort of a, <clears throat> of some sort of a, okay, so this works, this is able yeah. to retain attention. You're able to grab attention and keep it. Um, at the same time, you have to be very careful that it doesn't become uh, formulaic that it yeah. still has that complete breadth of freshness, uh, that there is no predictability with, uh, mm. with whatever it is that you deliver. And, and, you know, films retain your attention. Uh, yeah. It's not that people have stopped uh, watching full-length films or uh, even serials. You know, the series are um, a good hour or hour and a half long. So um, it's just, the, I think, how you, um, how you look at delivering the stories and if you are able to grab that interest. No, I completely agree with that because uh, with Netflix and other OTT platforms, people are binge watching series throughout, you know, uh, the day. And uh, yes, I completely agree uh, when you say that the way you deliver your content, the way you present your content, I think the art needs to speak out, needs to retain the attention of the audience. And that's how, you know, I think every artist needs to look at uh, their own content. So, you know, every uh, content creator who's listening to us right now, please take notes on this because it's really important that apart from being consistent about, apart from being passionate about your art, you also need to, uh, you know, figure out these nuances 
of uh, the social media, the the OTT platforms and other avenues where you can showcase your talent, but also retain the audience and make sure you grow your audience. So, uh, Savita, coming back to uh, the next segment, I want you, uh, you know, to tell our audience a bit about how Bharatnatyam, through Bharatnatyam, uh, you showcase or you tell stories the way you, you know, the expression diversity is present in Bharatanatyam. What makes this art form unique hmm. and and such such an old art form and still people love it? I mean, I have a few friends who have put their kids uh, in Bharatanatyam classes because I think it goes beyond just, you know, this being a dance form. I think this uh, this actually shapes your lifestyle in some uh, some way or the other. So please explain it to us, you know, how this whole thing works and what have you experienced in your, uh, you know, lifetime so far? Yeah, the I think what, uh, you know, the, the uniqueness of Bharatanatyam, of Indian dance forms, of Indian classical dance forms in general is, um, as you rightly said, the power of story in it. Mm. And as humans, I think we we gravitate towards narratives. We gravitate towards making sense of this universe. We love to take something, explore it, and when it when it relates to us, and it is that empathy, empathetic um, connection that you feel. Yeah. The music is talking to you. The dance is speaking with you. The movie is talking. Uh, to you, your sensibilities, the characters are speaking with you. So when when that connection is made, is that's really when um, that uh, you know the audiences are able to transcend and understand and explain and uh, embrace the stories and see themselves in it. So what Bharatanatyam does in a fantastic manner that say hip hop or uh, mm-hmm. Latin dance will not be able to compete with at all. And I mention those only because they're, they're, they're becoming very popular for uh, sending children to learn and, and for um, adults to participate in. Um, yeah. However, the, the storytelling narrative in Bharatanatyam is, is incredible. And as an artist, um, you know, so from the audience perspective, this is very true. And as an artist, what what uh, um, I find is is again a way to explore parts of me that are um, not able to be uh, channeled through any of the conventional, you know, the the ways of uh, um, exploring one's own uh, creativity. So mm-hmm. um, there is something about these classical dance forms, uh, the breadth of what this technique affords us. So there is not just the physical exertion, but there is also the, you know, the expressive emotional content. And the expression happens not just through the body, but it happens through the face, through the, you know, the entire language of uh, gesture. So there's, there's language through the body, through the eyes, through every pore of my body, um, you know, every every part of me is speaking something, mm-hmm. and that I think that um, uh, vocalization that happens is something I resonate very deeply with. It's it's how I express myself. So I'm a very kinesthetic person. Mm-hmm. So I think it it really helps for anyone that has that kind of sensibility. Now, we are all different. You might express yourself through music and, and find that level of connection uh, through, uh, you know, through listening and through, um, uh, through having your music speak for you. So um, for me, it's through movement. Yeah. So there, and I think that's where, um, where it might help to know what your child is um, you know, child, what makes them experience that wholeness, that uh, completeness. And that's really what this art form has uh, brought to me. It's it's allowed me to lead a very purposeful, complete, meaningful mm. life um, as, a, as an artist for myself. And I think uh, when I bring that to stage or to my films, there probably is, um, you know, I'm, I'm relating something um, to the audiences as well through through that. True, true. And th- that's the power of uh, any dance form, you know, be it Bharatanatyam, Kathak. Uh, I think the way you express yourself without the use of words and your dance forms, the way you move, uh, all all the expressions that you give on stage, I think everything boils down and, and uh, 
you know comes in a, in a unity and portrays the emotions portrays the story to the audience and when they get goosebumps i think you know that is where as an artist you feel that the job is done yeah and it's it's the unsaid right so yeah. it's it's finding that place where um, where you really haven't um, uh, expressed it explicitly and yet the audience has found a way to make their own personal connections with it um, true so there is there is that uh, platform where uh, you know you've you've connected and, and that's just uh, so unique and i think it's uh, very a uh, very vital part of what indian art forms dance forms are able to deliver i completely agree with that and the guys uh, you know go and check out uh, colors white colors green on youtube i'll share the links in the show notes below definitely go and check those out those videos will actually uh, so whatever we are discussing right now you know you can you could actually feel in those videos you would be able to understand more clearly as to what we are talking about and uh, when savita says that you know the movements the storytelling the emotions everything you can see in those videos you'll get a better idea as well apart from that please follow savita on instagram i'll share the links in the show notes below as well Savita uh, uh you know before we wrap up the episode any upcoming projects that uh, you know socially desi audience should look out for We are working on um the colors trilogy as you know it's based on the national flag and yeah. so we've, we've completed colors green and white and we're on to the next project colors saffron which uh, has a very unique uh, almost a sci-fi like um oh, okay. uh, picturization um mm-hmm. using bharatanatyam So oh. it it is a, a beautiful story that we hope to bring to life and um as soon as the you know the pandemic lockdown lifts uh, we're hoping to get into the shooting and production of that film um and on another uh, front there is um, also the the teaching that I do that I try mm-hmm. to share my techniques um for free on um, on a platform called the inner circle through my okay. website for any dancer uh, anywhere in the world that uh, wants any sort of mentorship on uh, you know right from technique to to how to um, make a production how to make a dance film uh, from basic to all the way uh, to delivering a, you know a fully packaged uh, production uh, this mentorship and videos associated with it are all available for free um, so this is something that uh, we are um engaged in uh, it through my production company it's the platform itself is called the inner circle and you can uh, search for it in my website savitashastri.com if you're interested in becoming a member wonderful so guys if you're listening uh, go check out uh, savitashastri.com and uh, the inner circle sounds really interesting and uh, in this world where everybody is fighting for that uh, penny from your pocket i think giving it for free especially this kind of an art form sharing this love with everyone for free i think that's that's commendable so thank you so much uh, and you know kudos to you and your team for uh, making this content sharing it for free on your platform uh, with that savita we come to the end of the episode uh, thank you again so much for being on the socially desi show you have been a delight to speak to and i would love to have you again on the show in the future Thank you so much it was entirely my pleasure and I'm looking forward to more opportunities thank you again So that wraps it up for today folks if you liked the episode give it a big thumbs up share it with your friends and let's go viral remember our weekly podcast features episodes on personal growth mental health relationships business and entrepreneurship and health and fitness we would love to have savita on our show again in the future to talk more about the beautiful world of bharatanatyam and storytelling so if you haven't yet done so hit that subscribe button and go check out our website at sociallydesi.com and as always before i sign off remember life is black and white and everything in between